They look like deep sea bunnies with claws. Fluffy, bizarre, and covered in hair, these crustaceans aren't what you picture when you think of marine survivalists. From teddy bear crabs to yeti crabs, their names sound more like stuffed animals than sea creatures. But every strand of fuzz is there for a reason. So why did evolution hand these guys a full body sweater? And how does all that hair help them live in the wild? Hi, I'm Danielle Dufault and you're watching Animal Logic. Let's explore the curious adaptations of hairy crabs. They've turned up in all kinds of ocean habitats, from scalding deep sea hydrothermal vents to coral reefs, tide pools, and even aquarium tanks where there are often unwelcome hitchhikers. At a glance, they might look like the ocean's plushy stuffy. Soft, small, and way too cute to be taken seriously. But don't be fooled! The teddy bear crab, Polydectus capulifer, has one of the strangest defense strategies in the ocean. This tiny reef dweller, found across the Indo-Pacific, is almost never seen without its signature move, waving a pair of sea anemones like living pom-poms, one in each claw. It waves these anemones like weapons, brandishing their tentacles at anything that gets too close. The sting won't kill, but it's sharp enough to startle or deter a would-be predator. It's a theatrical warning, like a boxer bouncing on their heels. You know the saying, float like a crab, sting like a jellyfish. It's a powerful strategy to fend off predators curious enough to approach, but not committed to a chemical fight. It's a surprisingly effective bluff, and the relationship goes deeper than intimidation. If the crab loses one anemone, it will split the other in half, causing each piece to regenerate into a full clone. It's one of the only known examples in nature where an animal not only partners with another species, but actively propagates it. I guess in a way it's a form of farming, only in this case they're growing weapons. For something this tiny and vulnerable, turning your claws into spicy nunchucks might be one of the most creative survival strategies on the reef. Teddy bear crabs feed on detritus, plankton, and tiny scraps of meat, sometimes the very prey caught by their anemones. They don't use their claws for eating at all, saving them exclusively to grip their symbiotic partners. Instead, they scavenge using their mouth parts and walking legs. Scientists believe leftover bits from these meals might be feeding the anemones too. And the relationship appears to be evolving in both directions. The anemones may be gradually adapting to life on the crab, becoming smaller and more specialized over time. For the teddy bear crab, survival requires teaming up. For the yeti crab, survival requires building a whole ecosystem from scratch. Although not a real crab, but a closely related crustacean, the yeti crab, Kiwa hirsuta, was first discovered in 2005 by a team of marine biologists exploring the deep sea along the Pacific Antarctic Ridge. It's a place of violent temperature swings, crushing pressure, and total darkness. What sets this crab apart is the dense mat of bristles covering its claws. These hair-like structures, called setae, are coated in bacteria, and the crab is farming them. The yeti crab, as well as other members of its genus, like the kiwa tyleri, waves its claws through vent fluid, exposing the bacteria to the chemicals they need to grow. Over time, the crab scrapes off the built-up bacterial clumps and eats them, harvesting a food supply grown directly on its own body. This is literally farming. The bacteria don't need sunlight. They extract energy from chemicals in the vent fluid. The crabs give them a place to grow and access to the compounds they depend on, and in return, it gets a steady source of nutrition in one of the most inhospitable ecosystems on the planet. For these crabs, every day is a good hair day, especially when it grows your lunch. Kinda wish mine would. In the ocean, vision isn't always the most reliable sense. Many crabs rely on something else instead, the ability to feel what's happening around them. The orangutan crab, 
Archaeus japonicus, is small, often no bigger than a coin, and covered in fine reddish hair. Each bristle plays a sensory role, helping the crab detect movement, pressure, and subtle changes in the water. When something shifts nearby, the crab feels it before it sees it. These hairs are packed with sensory cells and connected directly to the crab's nervous system. Just like a catfish's barbels, they respond to tiny changes in water movement, giving the crab early signals about nearby threats, shifting currents, or food drifting past. For a creature that spends its life tucked into reef crevices, this sensitivity is essential. In species that live in dark or crowded habitats, these sensory hairs often do more work than the eyes. Over generations, crabs in these environments have come to rely more on touch and chemical signals than on sight. But sensing the world isn't always enough. Sometimes, you have to fight back. And in a few species, hair plays a part in that too. For example, take the gorilla crab. Gorilla crab is the nickname given to a group of stocky, bristle-covered reef crabs in the genus Xantheus. They're tough, scrappy, and almost impossible to spot until it's too late. Aquarium owners dread them because once they're introduced, they wreak havoc on the tank. They're destructive, aggressive, and nearly impossible to remove. Their fuzzy claws might look like a quirky feature, but there are likely several evolutionary advantages at play. The hairs can trap fine bits of algae and debris, helping the crab disappear into the rocky textures of its surroundings. Most species are found throughout the Indo-Pacific region, especially around coral reefs and rocky lagoons. They're omnivorous opportunists, grazing on algae, scavenging for decaying matter, and even preying on smaller invertebrates when they can. Some researchers also think the hairs may serve a mechanical purpose, patting the crab's grip as it wedges into crevices, or shielding delicate joints from abrasion. These are animals that spend much of their lives pressed into narrow spaces, so any kind of physical buffer will help protect their exoskeleton. Additionally, it's thought that, like the orangutan crab, their bristles may serve a sensory role, offering early warnings long before a predator makes contact. And in the wild, they have something else working in their favor. Many of them are toxic. Some species of gorilla crab carry potent neurotoxins, like tetrodotoxin, the same deadly compound found in pufferfish and blue-ringed octopuses. There is no antidote for these toxins. Not even cooking destroys them. Most predators learn fast. Fuzz can mean many things. Sometimes it hides, sometimes it protects, and sometimes it warns you not to take a bite. We usually think of fur as a mammalian feature, but it's really not. All across the animal kingdom, evolution has produced bristles, fuzz, and fluff in species that have nothing in common. Tarantulas use theirs to sense vibration. Fuzzy caterpillars use it for defense. Frogfish vanish into algae thanks to hair-like camouflage. These structures show up again and again because they work for sensing, hiding, farming, or fending off predators. And that brings us back to crabs again. Hairy crabs aren't all closely related. In fact, they're a classic case of convergent evolution. Different crab lineages arriving at similar solutions for different problems. Hairy for over a hundred million years, they've survived shifting continents, mass extinctions, and everything the ocean could throw at them. Their fuzz might look decorative, but it's anything but, whether they're farming bacteria, blending into coral, or sensing danger in the current, one thing's clear. Sometimes the best way to thrive is to get fuzzy. So what should we talk about next? Please let me know in the comments and don't forget to subscribe for new episodes of Animal Logic every week. Thanks for watching and see you later. Bye.